Thank you so much for joining us today, uh, giving God praise, worshiping the one true and living Amen. God. He is mighty. Amen. He is here. Hallelujah. He is with you. Glory to God. And not only is he considering you, but he's mindful of you. Hallelujah. And we give him praise today. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Well, we welcome you again to the Church of Philadelphia Asbury Park campus. My name is Minister Kenya, and this is our newly minted minister, <laughs> Minister Lewis. Hallelujah. And we are so grateful to come before you all today. God has truly increased this house. We got a deacon in the house. Hallelujah. We got a hallelujah. We got a deacon mother in the house. Amen. So God is doing great and mighty things, and we're just grateful to be before you today. Amen. And so this is, amen, part two to the Altered Focus um, within the Alter Ego series. And uh, before we get into the word, we do want to say our decree. Amen. We're going to pray over the word, and then we're going to get right into it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So if you would say the decree with us, we would be grateful, grateful, grateful. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. I decree that my ears, heart, and spirit are open to receive the engrafted word of God, which is quick, alive, and powerful, active in the spirit of meekness. The ground of my life is fertile to nurture and grow the seed of God's word that will produce fruit in my life this week. I am a successful doer of what I will hear today, and I will leave here today full of faith, love, power, wisdom, and victory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So we're just going to open up in prayer, and we're going to jump right into it. Hallelujah. God, we give you glory. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, God. Lord, we exalt God you and lift you up, God, today in the name of Jesus Christ, God. Lord, there is no God like you, Father God. No God besides you, God. Hallelujah. God, it is a privilege, Father God, to serve the the one true and living God, hallelujah, that has given us life, oh God, that even through your word, oh God, you breathe life, God, into us, God, today in the name of Jesus. God, we yield, God, we surrender, Father God, to your word, God. Lord, we receive, God, your word, Father God, which gives us, oh God, direction and hope, oh God, and fuels our faith today in the name of Jesus, God. Lord, even as you're commanding us, God, to consider our ways, oh Father God, we're grateful, Father God, that you're, Lord God, leading us into light, God, not into darkness, oh God, leading us, God, to light. God, and not to death, oh God. So we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, God, that has paid the ultimate price, God, that we can live, God, and not die, God, that we can be saved, God, by him, oh Father God, the power, God, of his love, God, and his grace, God, and his truth in the name of Jesus. So God, we give you praise, and we honor you today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 As, uh, this is part two, y'all. This is part two. This is part two. I, I know celebration and, oh, man, celebration. Don't you take a moment for celebration? Yes, hallelujah. Celebration, church <laughs> celebration in Charlotte, North Carolina is so, so, so awesome. Go hand clap and praise. God, and hallelujah. And all our leadership and the amazing things yes, that they did hallelujah. to put that together for us. Oh, my God. So grateful. Uh, so right before celebration, we were in our altered focus sermon series, uh, Considered Our Ways, and now we're in part two. We didn't get the chance to finish part one, God was just speaking and moving, and it was just so profound. So here we are in the part two. You know, I don't even like to do part two, but you know this, y'all. So, but here we are in part two, Altered Focus. And on last week, if you didn't get a chance to listen to the message last week, or if you weren't here, we've been talking about the altar. In our altar series um, of alter egos and this meeting place, this exchange between us and God at this place of an altar, this place of communication, this place of sacrifice, of worship, of prayer. And we've been diving into how, uh, even uh, 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 in the last sermon series, about how our attention has no longer been in these places where God meets us and is trying to get us back into these places. And we, so we found ourselves in the book of Haggai. Amen? In the book of Haggai, we left off on verse 5 and 6, and we're going to pick up on verse 6, and we're going to float through. To give you a little bit of background, we find ourselves uh, with the children of Israel. They've just returned from exile from Babylon, and as they've come back from exile, where they've been there for 70 years, they found themselves back home, where God set them free, delivered them, uh, brought them back to uh, the place where now he's called them to rebuild the house, amen, and the first two years, they went strong, they went hard, the first two years, they began to build a house, and they laid the foundation, and they built the altar, but then after two years, something happened, they stopped working, 
the stop was. And then we fast forward, and it's 18 years later, and the house, the temple of God, is still not built. And we begin to talk about how their focus had shifted to themselves. And the scripture, it talks about how they began to just focus on their own sealed homes, their own houses, my place, my sanctuary, you know, this place that I call home, this place where I lay my head, these sealed homes that they've been building up, but they've been forgetting about the house of God. Amen. Their own cares and their own concerns. Right. Right. Uh, while the house of God lay waste. And, you know, on last week, God began to speak to us and he said our priorities have shifted. Our priorities have shifted. Right. And we became our own priority. Amen. Amen. So they've come out of exile. They forgot who freed them. Right. It was God who freed them. And now show and now they show no concern for the things of God. And this is where we pick up in this passage of scripture. But that's just like us sometimes. Sometimes we can look at this and we can relate even for to ourselves where, yeah, there's been some places that, you know, God has set me free, delivered me from. And, you know, when he did it, I was so excited. I was so happy. I was so joyous. I was so full of life. I felt my freedom. I was moving in the things of God. And then after a little while, I began to forget and I began to, you know, uh, 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 focus a little bit on myself. God began to move and I I, got, I started feeling myself just a little bit too much where now uh, I forgot who it was that actually did it for me, you know, uh, that maybe I could probably do a little bit of this by myself, you know. Uh, so, and we don't see ourselves sometimes and how our priorities and our focus have been altered away from anything concerning God, amen, the things of God. But this is the worst part, though, is that sometimes in the midst of that process, we begin to feel justified. Verse 6, let's pick up on verse 6. It says, ye have so much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put in a bag of holes. Mm -mm -mm. My God, nobody wants to be real and say that there are certain places where we feel, where you feel like you've given, where you've sacrificed where you've been doing certain things, where you've worked and you've toiled and you feel like you should have more to show for it. It says you have so much and bring in little. And I've been there where I, where I look at, man, God, all the things that I'm doing, all the things that are on my plate, all the things that I have to do, all the things that I had to do, all the things that you've spoken, family, you know, career, life, children. All these things, like, God, I'm, I'm giving ministry. I'm doing, I'm playing my part, God. Like, this is a lot. I'm sowing so much. God, I'm giving. God, I'm serving. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Do you even see me? Do you even see what I'm doing? Okay. All right, maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just me. I know I've been there. I've been there where I'm like, God, do you see what I'm doing? Do you see me? Do you see how much I've been pouring out? Are you taking notice to me, God? Have you forgotten me? Because it doesn't feel like I'm getting your attention. Does nobody want to be real today? We have a checklist that we say, God, you see, I'm doing this, man, all the way to Z, and I could start the alphabet all the way over again. H is square root of. <laughs> you got a checklist, and God, I've been doing this. Matter of fact, you go back. God, when I was a kid, I was doing this. You ain't even know God back then, but you was just, but I don't remember. Remember, Lord. Yeah, we got a checklist. And even even me, I've been in this place, and every time that I get to this place, and even recently, I'm just like, God, there are some things where I'm doing, and I'm like, I'm trying to see, and he cracked my face. He cracked my face. He said, you're counting everything you've done, pointing out what I know, but what you're not taking track of is what you missed, and what you're not talking about is, is what you've ignored. And I was like, see, this is why I don't like to talk to you all the time. Because, <laughs> again, I'll say, God, I'm working. God, I'm serving. God, I'm doing this thing. God, I'm doing ministry. I'm evangelizing. I'm dealing with people. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm praying. And I don't feel like I have anything to show for it. And then he said, you know, there are some things. Okay, well, let's look at everything. Let's, let's pull out this list. And as, I begin, and as we begin to look at it, he says, well, I didn't tell you to do that. That oh, that right there, that's what you want to do. You're doing what you feel will please me best. 
or you're doing what you feel you want to do. You're doing things where you want to feel like a good person. Oh, I don't know about you. I don't know if there's anybody out there who struggles with, you know, I want to be a good person and you put up this facade and you want to show people that, you know, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. But no one is good but the Father anyway. He said, you keep trying to look like you're a good person, but no one is good but me. And that's what you keep forgetting. And that's why when we look at this list and these places that you keep pouring yourself into and you said you've given and you've sacrificed, it's not even places that I called you to, not even places that I told you to focus on. I'm just, I'm just talking about me. There are things you're doing, places you went to, people you're involved with, simply because that's where you want to be. Mm-mm-mm. Let me say that one more time. There are things you've done, places you went to, and people you've just been involved with simply because that's what you want. You feel like this is what, you feel like you're overdoing it. You feel like, but this is what you want to do. You said yes to those places. That you, there's so much on your plate, but then where is that, and that you feel that there's a, a burden in these things now. But you chose those places. <laughs> Let me get mad. Because it's just like, okay, well, God isn't fixing our overwhelmed scenario. We chose and we also use that as an excuse to do what we get in the trouble for, right? Well, God, I'm focused on this. I know you told me, you t- I hear you, God, you tell me to go, but how, how am I supposed to do this? Well, you do it by going to do it, by leaving that because that's not what I called you to. We're talking about considering our ways. And we keep saying, I'm doing this, but I have that. Well, God, you want this, but I got this. I want your submission, but you keep bringing up your giving. You know how we do that? We say, well, God, I'm doing this. That should count for something. That's fine. (laughs) I want your obedience, and you keep bringing up the fact that you're on time to church. That's nice. That's good. You should do that. Yeah. But did you do what I told you? I want the discipline of your eyes. And you keep bringing up the fact that you gave to a homeless person. Mm -hmm. But God, I gave him my life. Yeah, but you can't control everywhere that you're looking, up, down, and all of that. Hmm. I require your power. And you keep trying to justify, well, God, I'm there for prayer. I'm on I'm available for prayer, okay, but where is your power? We keep trying to justify that we're doing something right here, but there's still something that we're ignoring somewhere else. Lord, help me. Being justified in being wrong. Yeah. It leads us to be Because in that, when you begin to try to compare or when you try to weigh the scales and it's just like, well, God, I am doing this. And then you begin to say, like, well, are you not counting that at all? And so the fact that you're not counting that at all and then you begin to get ungrateful with God. But it's just like, but just this. If you just do this, I'm fine. It'll be okay. (sighs) You're doing what's naturally what you look at and you think is fulfilling, but it isn't. And you're mad about it. You're mad. You're mad. It's full of anger. It's anger spit of anger where you're mad that here you are doing these things and you want to do and you want to still and, and you want to do when you say you want to be better but afterwards that you're uh, that you think that these things that you're, that you're doing they're going to make you better than where you were before it's going to move you along and then when you don't see like oh it's not yielding what I thought it was going to do here we are and you begin to here we are where we have to okay can we consider our ways in this the things you're doing are you connected to the things that you should this, oh, I thought this was going to bring me more happiness. And maybe it did at one point. Because, see, that's the thing. Some things that you begin to do from the onset, yeah, they make you a little happy. you just like, oh, okay. I, oh, I found a little something. Oh, I found a little friend. Oh, I got a little connection. Oh, God is moving in this place. Oh, there's a little door that's open. Mm-hmm. And at one point, it feels good. And you get sucked in, right? You're like, okay, well, let me, let me keep pursuing this thing. Something's right about this. But then you don't even realize over time it's adding to the problems that you're facing. 
And instead of taking the step back, instead of saying like, okay, let's 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 be good, let's 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 see what's happening. What we what we then do is just like because we don't want to feel like we're wrong, or because it's me, or because it's just like, um, well, no, I, this is where you don't want to acknowledge that. Hey, maybe you just maybe you missed the mark, and that's okay. We'll indulge in that thing even more. We'll go. It's just like, well, you know what? It's probably because I'm not giving it my all. Now I'm going to pour myself completely into this thing. Now I'm going to really give it my all. I'm going to go in. Instead of taking that step back to see that that was just the first taste that tasted like that. It wasn't supposed to continue to be that way. Mm. You were never supposed to be in that place. You were never supposed to be connected to that thing. And see, this is where the enemy can begin to wrap us up because... It's in that same where you give yourself completely to this thing, even though you weren't supposed to, right? Where shame and your pride and your ego will now come in again to where you don't want to feel like you're wrong, where you don't want to feel like you have to say and come come out and say like, hey, yo, I was I was wrong about that. I messed up. I messed up like. I heard wrong because you really don't think like you can hear wrong. I've been off. God, I, I genuinely felt that's what you said. Well, I'm glad that you're here considering your ways. Before I get so further along in this thing where it wraps me up in pride, my shame, my ego, and then leads me to isolation. Oh, yeah, yeah, because that's the goal. I can't tell nobody that. Mm-mm. Let me just. Let me just act like. Nothing's wrong because on the outside, you, you've already been making it seem like, look what God is doing for me. And now you got to backtrack like, yeah, that was just me. Not what he did for me. That was just me. What well, you've been showing, life is good. See, God is doing, mm, move with me. Yes. Everything is great, but you're crying on the inside. Everything is great, but I'm settled. Everything is great, but you're stressed. Everything is great, but you're sad because it's adding sorrow and you're not being real about it. you angry and you frustrated that no matter how much I've sown, you feel like you can't get ahead. And what we fail to see, just like the people here in the scriptures, your focus was altered. That's all. Focus was altered. Ye clothe you, but there is no warm, but there is none warm. See, the package looks good on the outside, right? Ooh, nice and packaged and sold. That's fine. Is that, is that Fendi? Mm. Is that new? Is that spring 24? That's nice. <laughs> but the contents are broken. You can dress it up all you want, but you can't hide the fact that the contents within are broken. And you're, we're putting on this appearance. It says warm. When you look at the word warm, it means in the Hebrew heat. Where we should be hot or cold. This is how God broke it down for me. We should be hot or cold, right? And you ain't hot. There is no heat. There's no warmth. Ah, uh, because you're cold. And it's a front. It's a real cold front. Ah, <laughs> uh, thank you, God. Pun. <laughs> and you don't even realize that this is opening up. This is opening up to the spirit of lies. Well, now you are lying. And you and this is the thing. We don't. Well, I'm not saying a lie out of my mouth. Yeah, but you're omitting the fact that. You need help. That you didn't hear. Oh, Lord, help me. He that earned wages, earned the wages to put into a bag with holes. And what God began to remind me of, I've been here been right in this place where I'm earning wages and it's just feel like I can't hold on to nothing. God is not going to continue to increase you so that you can continue to consume the blessings on your own lust. Come on. Say it one more time for me, sir. On your own lust. Your own lust. Okay, okay, okay. Hallelujah. Mm, amen. Yeah. 
If you want to get someone's attention, touch their money. Oh, man, you want to get my attention? Touch my money. I'll just keep talking about myself. You want to get my attention real good? You want to get somebody's attention? Let them lose lose their job. And then then they'll examine. God, let me come back before you. Let me see what am I doing wrong. Let me examine myself. Hmm, Because I need some instruction. Yeah. Because we'll begin to consider, like, okay, now I got more coming out than I do have coming in. So let me see, like, let me consider this. And let me see, like, okay, where can we save? Where can I budget? Where can I pull back on? Uh, what can I adjust? Okay. Uh, matter of fact, I'm going to cancel that subscription. You know what? We, I don't need Verizon. Let me go over to T-Mobile because, you know, they got the, uh, the $20 a line versus, you know, Verizon's $45 a line. So, you know, we can cut. We, we, I'm considering all the ways in which I could scale back. But where is that same when we look at, okay, if this isn't working, let me take a step back and consider this, God. Did I miss you? Come on. But it won't matter because no matter what you do, no matter what plans you make, no matter what things you change, no matter what things you try to alter, no matter what things you try to create, what system you try to put in place, no matter what adjustments you try to incorporate, yeah, yeah, I'm just talking about me, y'all. There's only one thing that can stop the hemorrhaging. Repentance. There's only one thing that can stop the hemorrhaging. There's only one thing that can stop, okay, this, this, that I'm bleeding on the inside, that I'm hurting, only one thing, and it's his repentance. Come on. Second Chronicles 7 and 14. Second Chronicles 7 and 14. If my people, who are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. There's only one thing, y'all. Repentance. Come on. You have to, we have to consider our ways. We have to realter our focus and get back to a place where we are focused on him, where we are, we've reshifted our attention. Come on, this is, he's calling us back to this place of rebuilding. Those torn down places, those places that you've neglected, those places that you have not considered, those places that you left that were no longer a priority. Come on, he was talking about some, to us about priority last week where we've been distracted. Come on, we got to get back to that place. This is what the Lord began to speak to me. He said, God said, stop trying, stop robbing me of your time, your body, and your money. He said, stop robbing me of your time, your body, and your money. And come back to the altar. And when we look at, if you, were to, if you were to consider the things that you're doing, if you were to consider some things, I had to. I'm looking at this for, uh, you know, I thought I had this right. I thought I was going, nope. Okay, God, robbing you of my time here. Okay, how can I adjust that? Okay, robbing you of my body here. Okay, cool, how can I adjust that? You know what, I could be giving a little bit more here. How can I adjust that? Thus saith the Lord of hosts in verse 7, consider your ways. And what's crazy, this is the second time. We saw it and we saw it last week. This is the second time he says, consider your ways twice. This is the witness. This is where you need to take note. And there are some places that we have to be honest about that. You know what, God, this isn't the first time I'm hearing this. Because he came to me last week. Or the vow came to me the week before. My wife came to me yesterday. Okay, everybody's saying the same thing. Are they, are they in cahoots? <laughs> I know they're talking to each other on the side. And we begin to think that. We, we'll, we'll think the worst. We'll think negative. And not, not that God is speaking to these people to send me a word so that I can course correct. No, they talking about me on the side and they after me. Yeah. We'll go and think the worst. No, that can't be you, God. Oh, my. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. What does consider mean? Consider. To view attentively. To sit. To sit. The literal sense or to sit close by. To mind or the eye to. Hence, to examine. To give attention. 
But this is what I thought was interesting about consider as well. Not only is it about you looking or giving something your attention and your eye, it also means to put, to place, to set, to appoint, to make. These are action words now. To set, station, put in place, set, to plant, to fix, to make, to transform into, contribute, to work. So when God is saying consider your ways, he's not just saying it like, hey, give this a thought. He's saying, no, give this a thought, take, a, make, uh, take notice, pay attention, and now change. Because I know what I'm talking about. See, you, th- you still think God coming to you saying consider your ways is just like, you know, you should think about that. You know, get back to me on that one. Pray about it, you know, and then we can talk a little bit more. No, when the Lord comes says consider your ways, he's just saying, I know I'm right. You off. And you need an adjustment. You need to change your focus. You need to look at this thing a different way. Matter, You probably need to go back to the word. Matter of fact, when Mother Val, oh, Deacon Val, (laughs) Minister Ketsia, and your wife came to you and said those three things, that was me, a trifecta. Not just consider, make the change. It's not just you like, okay, well, let me stew on this. You know what? I'll consider that. You know what? I hear you, God. Like, I'm going to really mull that one over. I'm going to really meditate on that one. You know, I'm going to take that one into prayer tonight. <laughs> yeah. Later. It doesn't just mean to think about it. It means to do something. And, hey, I'll admit, my wife can attest. There are some things, even when not only just the considering of, of your ways that, or, okay, I'll just say this. Sometimes I can get stuck in my own mind. Sometimes I can get stuck in my own head. Sometimes I can stew over something so much that there's no action. That I'm like trying, it's almost like I'm trying to will my mind to make a, an action. But it's really, I just don't know how to make a decision. And I'm struggling with making a choice. Because a part of that is I'm really fighting my own will. Oh, my. And you can stay stuck in your own head to the point that you become stagnant. And nothing gets done. My God. Sometimes even in places that we've erred. Oh, my son. Sometimes where we've erred, we think on it. And you think on it so much that you'll lead yourself into condemnation. Mm. Yeah. God, I messed up. I messed up so bad. And God is just like, okay, thank you. Now, what are we going to do about it? Oh, God, I messed up. And it drives us to this place of condemnation to the, pla- to the point where we get stuck. And I love, Pastor Lincoln, he saved my whole life. You know, uh, a couple months back, I'm going through some things. It was, a, it was a, I mean, we've been going through some things. It was some tough places, and I couldn't sort through. I couldn't get my mind to get past this, what was happening. I couldn't get past the situation. I couldn't get past my feelings about it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, and I'm driving myself into condemnation. He said, Lou, you got to remember, there's a difference between conviction and condemnation. Because even when I went before God, I'm just like, God, I'm just like, this is crazy. I don't know what to do. You know, this is just so hard. Like, God, I just need you to be. (sighs) Tell me who I am. Show me your glory. Uh, Tell me something nice. Because I'm hurting. And he said, you're in a backslidden state and you're a hypocrite. Just like that. And I was like, it's not what I wanted to hear, you know, but it was what I needed to hear. Because here I am, I'm operating in condemnation. I'm trying to kill myself. I'm trying to hurt myself, you know, with the, the, the errors that I made. And then I'm like, okay, God, will you make me feel good if I can't make myself feel good? And he's just like, no, because what you're feeling is right. And I'm just going to confirm that you're in a backsliding state and you're a hypocrite. But see, when when God speaks, this is the difference that he reminded me of, that he's not going to tell you a truth that you can't change from. 
And when he gives you that truth, you can say from there, like, okay, aware. Got it? Let me refocus. And now, what do I have to do to change, God? God corrects us to makes us and makes us consider our ways so that we can change, not continue to operate in a place of condemnation, God. Verse, six, verse 8 says, go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Go up. What does go up mean? It means to ascend, to climb, to meet. Come on, we're talking about an altar, this meeting place. There are some places that you're going to have to climb to get to him. Because you got to climb out of this hole of condemnation that you're in. Come on, you got to climb out of this hole of bad decisions that you've made. Oh, come on, nobody want to be real. It says to come up before God, to offer and to bring up gifts. Greatest gifts you can give, like, God, here I am. Again, you know, I remember I used to be like, man, God, when am I not going to have to just keep coming to you about the same thing? Where I feel like I'm coming to you about the same thing, like, and I feel like I'm, you know, am I, is progress even being made? Like, you know, am I, like, am I broken? That is this is this how always how life is going to be that I got to keep bringing you this thing over and over again, just throw it in my side that I can't get over. And he helped. He was just like, no. Because that's the point that you keep bringing it to me, that your offering of your body, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto me. It's your reasonable service. And it's the only place that you can get help with this thing. You keep coming to me. And the reality was I just didn't have enough word in me at the time to fight this thing. But that's what he was trying to do. You come to me. I'm going to give you more. I'm going to encourage you in this way. I'm going to remind you about this thing. I'm going to help you to understand what it means to watch and be so reminded so that even when this thing comes, it won't be like, oh, here I am again. Here I am in a fallen state again. Here I am standing in the need of prayer again. We're now from there. Or, and it takes you uh, 20 weeks to, to come out of your rut. No. Well, now it's just like, hmm. Right after. Okay, mm, messed up. All right, let me pick myself back up. God, here I am again. But, mm, that's, not, that's not who you said I am. That's not, this is not my end. Like, I'm still going to give you glory. I'm still going to push. I'm still going to climb. And we've been in such a low and stagnant state for so long that God said it's time to get up. Mm-hmm. It's time to get up. We keep wallowing in certain places, and it's time to get up. There's some places that you have to climb out of this thing to come back to the altar where you find the strength that you need. Because it's not just a place where he's not just saying, yeah, just, co- just come over here. He's not just trying to meet you just to meet you. He's trying to meet you to strengthen you. He's trying to meet you to give you truth. He's trying to meet you to give you instruction. He's trying to meet you to give you encouragement. He's trying to meet you to show you a way out. Come on. Can I be honest? There's some places where I was just like, go up to the mountain, bring the God, what's the point? Oh, nobody want to be real? You never went to God and just like, God, what's the point? What's the point? Because I don't have this in place. You know, there even some things concerning the ministry, I was just like, God, what's the point? This is not in place. That's not in place. I'm not in place. Rome got this. People left. People go. What's the point? Cracked my face real good, though. And he said, so obedience is pointless? I said it just like that. And then he brought me to Colossians 2, 23, 24. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. And not unto men. And I had to look at myself like, mm, who am I doing this for? Am I doing this for me? Mm. Oh, am I doing this so that other people can see that I'm doing good and everything is okay and I'm a good person? Like, who am I really doing this for? Am I doing it unto you, God? Because if I'm doing it unto you, yeah. Obe- it, it wouldn't be a question. Whew. It wouldn't be pointless because I know I'm doing it unto you. Knowing that ye the Lord shall receive the reward of inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, it's exposing your faith. Oh, you don't think that this obeying me will yield you a reward or an inheritance. Mm. And you're doing it. Consider your ways. 
And when you get to these places where you begin to say these things, like something like, what's the point then? Like, okay, that just came out of my mouth. If these are my thoughts, let me consider this thing. Why do I feel this way? God, what am I, why am I thinking like this? Why is hopelessness feeling like it's starting to set in concerning this thing? Who am I really doing this for? Unto men. And sometimes men, just like we look at the scripture, how they were doing it for themselves, for their own sealed homes, you'll do it for yourself. You're part of that. That men, you're part of that. You in that group. Where you begin to do it for yourself. Where you begin to think about solely and only yourself. And you mask it in self-care. Because I can't give out if I'm not, if I don't have anything to give. But in the presence of the Lord is times of refreshing. So the thing that you need, the altar that you need to go to, so that you have to continue to give, that's the place that you're not going to. But you'll focus on self. You'll get your mani petty. You'll get that massage, that hot stone. You know, that isolation. Do not disturb. And you know what? I'm just, I just, I just gotta go two hours, and you know, I gotta meet people. Mm -mm. Nobody. Sanctuary. <laughs> and we'll do that. We'll do that for self. Take those same two hours and go into prayer. Those places you've laid waste, he begins to talk about. Where your heart, your mindset, your self-esteem, your service, he's calling it up. Come on, say it out your own mouth. I'm not going to lay waste. Come on, say it again. I'm not going to lay waste. Uh, say it like you mean it. I am not going to lay waste. I'm not going to lay waste. He's calling me up. Go up to the mountain. That I be glorified, saith the Lord. And when we've been stagnant, we feel like it's going to take an uphill climb at the onset. Resistance. Go up the mountain. Resistance, terrain, gravity, pulling you back. Fatigue, because you're tired. You're tired when you started, and you're going to be tired as you go. And you got to fight what you see. Faith. Do the same instruction he gave us at the same place where he'll give you strength. Yeah. Carrying this wood. Wood, rep wood represents two things. The natural feeling you have when you have to fight through something. It represents a natural thing. See? Natural. It's talking about carrying it with you. These natural things, sometimes it's us, sometimes it's our own issues, sometimes it's other people. So he began to break it down to me. Wood also represents salvation. Because when you look at wood, that was the ark that saved the people. The inner materials of the temple where we worship. Christ on the cross. It represents salvation. Why is this so important? The reminder that you can't do it alone. And that those places where your own condemnation has led you into isolation, yeah, has brought you into your own seal home where it's just like, well, I'm going to just focus on here and this, and I'm in my own little bubble, and I'm going to just focus, I'm going to just do these things to make me happy, represents isolation. These sealed homes represents isolation. When you isolate over the course of time, the focus will only be on you. And I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. When we run, when we isolate, we are saying, God, God, I don't want you to take pleasure in me. I don't want you to use me. I don't want to have to pay attention to that. I don't want you to be glorified. That's not the words that you'll say out of your own mouth, but your actions, that you know that's what they're denoting, right? You know that's what's happening, right? Mm. Come on. We have to consider our ways. Verse 9. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, I thought it was so interesting. You know, this this phrase, consider your ways, it's only mentioned in the word in Haggai. In, in the, he says consider in different places. But this phrase, consider your ways, is only and specifically in Haggai. And so I was like, Lord, why, why is this having to be repeated? You know, and there's a weight of being told something twice. 
You know, there's a weight to being told something more than once, especially when it's in instruction, because the first time you're you're so in your head, right? The first time you weren't really listening. You know, when I was a child, my mom used to have to tell me things three and four, five times, you know, because the first time I overthought. The second time I thought about doing it, but I didn't. The third time I was like, okay, I'm going to do it, but then I didn't do it right. The fourth time she had to repeat it so that I did it right that time. You know what I mean? And so sometimes the Lord has to repeat things so that, he gives you an opportunity to get it all the way right. Wow, wow, wow. Amen? Yeah. You know, the, what God has begun in us, sometimes we have to hear it multiple times so we can get it all the way right. You know what I mean? We've gone through life so much doing things in part or partially right or kind of excellent or like it was sort of good. We got so used to that, and we started calling that excellence. And God is like, no, that's still mediocre. No, that's still just good. Amen. And God is calling us to this betterment. Amen. This better place. And I want to encourage you. That's that's an exciting place. Amen. God is trying to set you apart. And we're not going to be set apart if we're not doing things different than than everyone else. Essentially, you know, we, we, we're so used to hearing things in cliches or, you know, repeating what we've heard. But if we're not really living it, if we're not really taking it on for ourselves, it, it just stays blah. It stays mediocre. And I want to encourage us that even though this word, sometimes it feels hard at times because it feels like a judgment. It feels like, Lord, you coming for me, <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm like, I'm not in that place. Well, we are in that place to be bettered. Amen. We, we always want to be better. So we can't just take the, the pat on the back betterment. We have to take that, you know, okay, consider your ways, change your ways, do better betterment as well. Amen. And so by the time we get to verse 8, it felt like, okay, we're about to be encouraged. You know, God is saying, God is saying, go up the mountain, bring the wood, build the house, and I will take pleasure in it. You know, it feels like, oh, it's about to get like, yeah. Verse 9, <laughs> it says, you looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why? Saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and you run every man unto his own house. Amen. We're talking about considering our ways. And my husband be began to speak about the considering. I want to talk about the ways. Amen. Because we think our way is the best way. Well, we don't consider the direction sometimes that we're going, right? Okay, our GPS can give us options several ways that we can go, right? There's the, there's the cost-efficient way. There's the no-tolls way. There's the, you know, direct route way. There's a lot of ways we can take. And so when we're considering our ways, I want to encourage us, consider the direction in which you are going. Because sometimes we, t I'll tell you this, taking your own way is always going to be the no-tolls way. It's it's going to be the way where you, you it's going to take you longer. It's always going to take you longer. And you're not realizing that the cost that, you're, that you think you're saving by going your own way is really just taking you that much longer. Amen? So we have to make sure that we're considering our way because we're really saying, okay, Lord, I, we can be honest. We can be like, Lord, I think this is the best way to go. And he'll tell you, no, that's not me. That's, that's you. You know, <laughs> that's all you. Let me, let me take you the shortcut. Amen. Let me take you the shortcut. And we don't think God has given us the shortcut. We have to be honest. We, we think God is taking us like all round about. But I'm telling you, God is not about wasting. And so he's going to take you the, the path that's going to get you there sooner. But because we're not willing to do all the things that it takes to get there sooner, we take that much longer. Amen. When we talk about when we talk about ways, we talk about the journey. Right. So that's the course of life. It's the road. It's the path. And it's like, well, Lord, isn't that similar to direction? Well, no, the the journey then is all of the things that are a part of that process. Right. And so what God is beginning to speak to us about considering our ways, it's like, Lord, how do I want this journey to look? ultimately. And we turn to the word to say, okay, this is what the journey could look like. We can all look back in retrospect and say, you know, I didn't have to go that, that my journey didn't have to look this way. You know what I mean? We can all look back and, and that's where that spirit of regret, right? And you're just like, oh God, you know, I could, I could have been here sooner. I could, my life could look so much different, all these things, but in the grace of God and in the compassion of God, he, he'll turn all, all of those things around for good. Amen. But once you realize that that's what he's done at this stage, now you have to consider, okay, well, I'm not going to go that journey again. I'm not going to fall in that same area again so that I then have to go all around about just to come back to the same point that God, you're good, God, that you're able, God, you're grace, gracious. Because at some point, 
grace is not forever. Amen. At some point, if you stop considering your ways, you are going to lead to a place of death. That's what sin is. You know what I mean? We, we end up falling into this place and we think just because we're still living, we still have breath that we don't think that we're dead, you know, but there are certain areas where it's just like, Lord, I'm looking for life here, but it's not there. What's happening? What am I not considering? Amen. And so that's there. When we talk about ways, we're talking about our habits. Ooh, I was like, Lord, you know, I have good habits in some areas and I have his poor habits in other areas. Usually in those areas where my habits are poor, somebody else recognizes it, right? Somebody else is like, I don't, I don't think that looks, that, that doesn't look good for you. You know, uh, uh, that habit is something that you keep doing. You know, that, that habit is something that you do it so frequently that somebody else can say, well, let me, let me tell you, you might want to consider doing it differently. You know, uh, it's, it, they say, well, I don't know if it's changed now, but they say it takes 21 days to change a habit. Well, that's because it takes 21 days for you to observe what you're doing, for somebody else to observe what you're doing. And then it takes, after that 21-day period, then you're finally, like, wrapped your mind around the fact that, okay, I should probably do this differently. I should do something else. So when God's telling us consider our ways, I want to encourage you, consider your habits. What are those habits that you have that almost feel unbreakable, right? What are those habits that you have that you're just like, well, I mean, I keep going back to this vice or I keep going back to this coping place, you know, and it's not yielding anything. It's not, it, nothing's changing, you know, and that's the, that's the, the scary thing about a habit, right? You think once it becomes a habit, you're used to it, right? You're used to doing it. And I think that's where the children of Israel were. They were used to 16 years, they were used to doing their own thing. So for God to come and send a word, this feels like a blow. You know what I mean? And when, it says, and when he brought it home, I did blow upon it. This felt like a blow to the chest because they were so used to thinking about themselves. Wow, wow, wow. They were so used to considering their own selves that it was like, Lord, now you're trying to tell me to, to redirect and do it your way. I'm not used to that. Amen. And we have to get honest that there are certain things that we've we've gotten used to doing it habitually wrong, that when God comes oh to course my. correct, it doesn't feel right to us. And when wow. something doesn't feel right to us, we're like, well, that, that can't be God. Well, it's like wow. that. That's not quite it. Right. Come on, come on. The last thing a way is a manner. And this is the way of acting. So uh, how you the way in which you deal with a with a situation. Right. So God is looking for us to consider our ways. How are you going to deal with the judgment? How are you going to deal with, okay, what God is saying that has offended him? I, I know in my relationships, I didn't do very well when somebody was telling me that I, like, offended them or that I hurt their feelings or that, you know, because it, even though they were saying that it, I did something to hurt them, it made me kind of look at myself and say, you know, well, I, I, I can't do anything right. Uh, uh, we begin to take that, on, that truth and take it on ourselves. That's a way of doing something that's not healthy. It's not healthy. It's not healthy because then that makes that, that person feel like they can't tell you, you know, that you did something wrong, that's right? True. You know, if my husband feels like, well, every time I tell you that, you know, I don't like something, you recoil, you go into a pouting, a tantrum, all these things. Well, that's not going to make him come to me with his truth anymore. Amen. And so this is what God is trying to do in the people. He's like, okay, you can't just have a, a, a pleasant manner when I'm coming to you with the good stuff. You have to learn to have a pleasant manner when God's coming to you with the judgment, come with the on. correction, with the, with the you're not doing Right. Because ultimately, that's his love, too. Amen. Amen. So it said you looked for much and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. And I want to encourage us. God's judgment reminds us to consider him. Right. It's a reminder. Uh, if 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 my mom right. never, you know, punished me or whatever, I might not consider. Oh, you know, maybe I shouldn't touch the stove. Oh, maybe I shouldn't go there. Oh, maybe I shouldn't do this. So the punishment comes as a reminder. Like, right. oh, oh. Right, 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 right. Let me consider that. Let me consider that, right? So punishment, punishment makes us aware that we've done something wrong or that we've offended God. Psalm 50 and 21, I love this, this set of verses. It says, these things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such and one as thyself, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver you. So what happened was they, they got common with God. And that's what the people of Israel began to do. They, over, over the course of that 16 years, 
They got common with God. They were like, Lord, your, your stuff is like That's my it. stuff, isn't it? You know, my stuff is kind of like your stuff. Wow. If I take care of me, I'm taking care of you. Ooh. You know, like they began to mix you know, their yeah. understanding yeah. Of, of God. And that was that was wrong because then that's bringing God down to our level. He's no longer holy if he's on our level. Amen. And so God began to say, how can I I can't deliver you if I'm on your level. You can't you can't even deliver yourself. So you cannot bring me down to your level. Amen. And so we have to be considerate not to bring God down to our level. Amen. Wow. So what he's also dealing with here is their their contentment or their lack thereof. You know, isn't it true that, you know, when we get content in a thing, it's possible that we are more concerned with our own success than we are concerned about the, the, the success of the kingdom, all those things. So it might feel like it, it might feel like, you know, I, I'm being considerate, you know, by doing this, the task, the task, the task, but I've lost the heart of the matter. I've lost the, the heart of the thing. Come Amen. And God's trying to get us back to the heart of the thing. That's why in verse nine, he says, why, you know, when I, when I need to consider something, I need it in the form of questions. You know what I mean? Cause sometimes I'm not going to think about something on my own, but if God says like, why I'm like, well, why, why did I do that? You know, why did, why, why did I think of it that way? Well, he was like, well, I'll, I'll tell you. <laughs> he said, say if the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. So let's look at, let's look at this concept of, of waste, right? You know, um, what if building God's house became our lifestyle instead of just that thing that we do on Sundays? You know what I mean? This is the part of the habits, right? This is the part of the ways. And what happened, I really do believe over the course of time, they they put God in a corner for for that like for one day or for one hour or for one moment instead of making his ways a part of our lifestyle. Amen. You know, when I go to work, my if my lifestyle is that of the kingdom, I'm looking like somebody need God today. I know somebody in here need a word. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, when I go about, when, I, and when I'm in the grocery store, when I'm doing different things, when your mindset becomes that of God, your wow. ways mimic his. Jesus didn't go anywhere without ministering to at least one person. You know what I mean? He was, and that one could have been one, could have been 5,000. Like he, he was very purposeful and intentional in that way. When we consider our ways, he becomes our intention. Amen? And so the, the thing about what he's speaking here is he's like, my house was was wasted my house was wasted the thing that you know apostle was very mindful of is that he took ownership right he took he very much took ownership of his relationship with god he didn't let you talk about his god he didn't let you mess with his god he didn't let he didn't let you mess with god's right. thing his things which meant his people as right. well amen and i don't think that we've taken that ownership to say okay lord the house is wasting away you know like i got to do something about it because this is mine too Amen. And when we're considering the ways of God, we consider like, God, this is mine, too. My marriage. God, this is this is yours, too. You know, uh, 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 the, the people of God, they're yours, too. And so I can't just treat these things any old kind of way. And if you really love something, if you're really considerate of something, OK, we're human. We might we'll mess up. Right. We're, we're going to make mistakes. But you'll only make that mistake but so long, right, because you're considerate of it. So, you know, if my husband's, like, upset, I, I'm, I might be like, okay, I got to keep doing work. I keep doing work. But if I'm mindful, if I'm considerate, I am going to make sure I, like, hey, are you good? Like, are, is everything working? Is, is, you know, all those things. And that's essentially what God was doing when he said why. Like, he, he's just pointed to the fact that you're letting my stuff waste away as if it's not your stuff too. Amen. Amen. Right. You're letting my, you know, what I've built up, you're letting that altar waste away as if it's not your altar too in exchanges between two people in exchanges between two people and so if you're coming to God's things as if God like this is your stuff over here and this is my stuff over here then you're not getting the point you're not grasping you know that the fact that okay if the house of God is desolate and it's dry and it's parched so will you be Amen. If the, if the things of God, if the spirit of God, if, if all of what God is trying to bring life to, if his stuff is dead, so will you. You'll become that as well because you're attached to him. You're attached to his house. You're attached to his people. Amen. And so we have to do a better job of taking ownership of what God has given us. Amen. What I love about this place, we're talking about considering in our priorities. Um, you know, at, at one point in my life, I was a, a Mary Kay sales director. And Mary Kay is awesome, awesome, awesome in the sense that their motto is God first, family second, career third. 
no matter what you did, it, it, obviously the company is about their business, right? But no matter what they did, they were always like, God first, career, family second, career third. It was like ingrained, amen? And there are some things that God wants to ingrain in us so that we don't get away from it. Amen. And I just think that over over the course of time, whatever was not ingrained in the people of God after they left Babylon and they were they had that two years of rest and a little bit of rebuilding. It just wasn't ingrained. And we think that just because we're hearing the word every day at 5 a.m. prayer and just because we get it on Wednesday and just because we come on Sunday, we think it's ingrained. It's not until you take action. It, it's not going to, it's not really, you can hear something all day and it not really be ingrained until you take action in it. Amen. So verse 10. It says, therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And so this place, I was like, Lord, so you're just going to cut off my supply of needs? You know what I mean? But essentially, he's like, well, you cut off, you know, the needs of the house, you know, by by pulling away, by not doing what, you know, God called you to. You pull the resource out of the house. And, and so when we begin to experience lack and all of these things, it's like, Lord, what happened? Like, why aren't we flourishing? Why aren't we this? Well, he's like, well, you, you guys have pulled your resources out. You pulled your money out. You pulled your time out. You pulled your resources. You pulled your, your giftings out. And so now my house is wasting away. But I, I need you to know that these things, are you're, you're not going to be able to watch it happen. It's going to hit your house eventually. Amen. Leviticus 26 and 19, it says, and I will break the pride of your power and I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. And so it's like, Lord, I feel like the favor of God has lifted. Amen. Because we don't, we don't really feel like the favor is gone yet. Cause you know, we got swag, we have personalities, you know, it's, it's like we can make some things happen for ourselves, but there you begin to feel it. Like, Lord, it feels like your grace is lifted. It feels like your, your favor has lifted. It. And essentially, that's what happened. Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew. That word stayed, it means like it's shut off, like it, it's restrained. So it's not that God took it away. He stopped it. He stopped it. And he's, and he's going to stop that evidence. When you wake up in the morning and there's dew on the grass, that's evidence that something happened, you know, last night. Either it rained or, you know, the, the, the moisture in the air kind of hit the grass. You, you, you understand something happened. And so I want to encourage us, amen, because I want to encourage us because it might feel like, Lord, this is, it's heavy. It's heavy, Lord. But the thing is, the goal is to restore. It's always to restore. That, that, that's not, he's not going to waste his breath if he wasn't trying to restore the people, you know what I mean? So if he wasn't, if he's, if he's not going to look to restore this place of pr prosperity and abundance, he's not going to say anything to you. He'll just let you wither away. He'll just let you go about your business. He'll let you wallow. He'll let you be in sorrow. But God is coming and he's speaking because he wants you to prosper. Amen. And if we don't consider our ways, the, the prosperity can only go but so far. Amen. And so it says, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. That That's another place of something being cut off and that place of producing and wealth and increase. We're looking to increase our own selves. And there's so many ways to do it, right? Like you can go on YouTube and they're telling you a million ways that you can get wealth and get it quick. You know, there's a million ways that you can uh, 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 invest and do all these different things. Well, the Lord is like, I got like two ways if you just read them. You know, uh, uh, um, I, I have a, a two, you know, a way of faith that if you just do that, that's a place of prosperity and increase. Amen. And so God is looking to restore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 11. And it says, and I called for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains and upon the corn and upon the new wine and upon the oil and upon that which the ground bringeth forth and upon men and upon cattle and upon all the labor of the hands. I, I love, I have a love-hate relationship with this first part. It says, and I called for a drought upon the land. It's not the devil, y'all. And, you know, sometimes when we're going through the first finger that we're pointing at is, is him, it's her, it's the devil. God, you coming for me? I'm, t you know, I, and, I, and, and I'm feeling it on every side. God is like, and I called for a drought upon the land. Amen. And what happens 
similar to what my husband said, what else is going to get our attention sometimes until something gets cut off? Some, somebody that, you know, something happens that like says, whoa, you know, Lord, that could have been me or, or that was me or it is me now. That's what happens. And God begins to do things even in the earth realm to get our attention. Amen. And this drought, drought is a place of dryness. It's in, and it's, it's desolate. It's, it's heated. And sometimes when we're in the heat of a situation, we feel like giving up. We're like, Lord, it's, it's getting hot in here. It's getting pressure. I feel the pressure. I feel the weight. I feel, I feel you know, myself giving up in this. And God's like, I, I'm doing certain things. I'm allowing certain things to get your attention. Amen? Amen. This, will, this place of dry, this place, of, it, it says uh, dry upon the land and upon the mountains. Okay? So let's talk about that land, right? This is the thing that you tread on. This is the, the thing that you're walking on. This is the thing you could own it or it could be somebody else's. But it, at this point, God is like, I'm going to dry up everything that your feet will tread on because that, that's, that's what you're used to, right? We're talking about our habits. You're used to going here and, and not caring. You're used to going here and not paying attention. Well, he's like, okay, well, the stuff that you're used to, I'm about to bring something. It's going to look a little different for a, for a season because this is the area I need you to pay attention in. Amen. This place, this mountains, it says, and upon the mountains, high things you've exalted above God. Amen. So he's going to dry up those things that you've put above him. Now, there are some things that we put on the same level as God, right? Sometimes we'll put money on the same level as God because we like, it provides, you know. It also makes me feel good, you know. Like, we'll put certain things on his level. But there are those things that we put above God. Sometimes it's in waves. You know, sometimes we'll put a relationship above God for a season. Or we'll put, you know, sometimes money will, you know, be above God. But I want to encourage us that begin to consider the things that you've placed above him. Um, even a, 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 a sometimes a sign of it is putting things above your own needs. You know what I mean? Because you'll, God will begin to show like, okay, I, I have supplied all of your needs according to my riches and glory, all those things. But if you feel like, well, I want a little more than like what you're saying you're providing me for, like that's okay. But then you begin to look at your needs and then something above that is just like, okay, well, I am considering that I do need this, but I want this. You know what I mean? I know I need to eat better, but I want to eat however I want. Like sometimes you have to recognize that there are things even above your needs that you are trying to consider even more than what than, than you're supposed to. Amen? The, the corn and the new wine and the oil, it says that he's going to dry up these things. These are your, this is your produce. You know, there comes a time where, like, you used to be super fruitful. Like, you used to, like, you used to come up with ideas. You used to come up with, you know, and they were witty inventions. You know, it used to help the body of Christ. It used to, it was like, man, you had so many brilliant things that you were producing. And then all of a sudden that starts to dry up. You're like, man, I can't come up with an idea for nothing. You know, I, I can't, I can't figure this out for my life. You know, I can't, um, you know, uh, and, and then this, point, this place of oil, that also is the place of the anointing. God, we begin to speak about that demand that's on our anointing. Well, the thing is, people can't put a demand on your anointing if you're not thinking about what God is thinking about. God is, God is going to anoint something that's going to bring fruit for him, for his purpose, for his will. So we're looking to be like super people in all these different areas. But if we're only trying to be super for ourselves or we're only trying to be super for like people, it, it's, it's going to fall flat after a while. Amen. It's going to be like kryptonite. You know, that selfishness, it does become like kryptonite to what God is trying to do in us. Amen. And so he's going to begin to dry those things up. It says, upon, oh, amen, upon that which the ground bringeth forth and upon the men and upon the cattle. So that which the ground brings forth is that place of growth. The place of men is the place of relationships. And that place of cattle is the place of money. And I'm so grateful that my husband began to talk about that time and our body and our money being the things that we need to give back to God. Amen. Those things that we need to say, Lord, I, I need help considering these things. Amen. Because that, that growth, sometimes you think like I've arrived. You know, like I'm good in this area. How much more, how much greater can I be, you know, in a particular area? And God's like, mm, you, 
You have a ways to go. Amen. Or maybe it's time for you to go to the next level. You know, you level out, right? Maybe you're the best at this level. And when God's trying to take you higher, you, you come back to base level because other people have been at that level longer than you. I want to encourage you that wherever God is taking you, whatever levels God is taking you to, there is, there's place to grow in that. You're still needing to grow in that. Amen. And the people of God here, they had stopped growing. You know, the moment they started to separate themselves from God, maybe their houses were growing up but they themselves they weren't growing they were in that house stagnant as could be amen where we're looking for God to grow relationships well first of all if it's not the relationship that God wants to be grown he's going to dry it up anyway but sometimes what God does want to grow we're not capable of growing it because we're trying to grow it on our own strength our own power that self-help book you know like all those things we're trying to do it outside of God's will amen and then the cattle the cattle cattle cattle, cattle represents that money and we're trying to grow the money and we're not giving back into the house of God we're trying to grow our wealth and God's house is wasted amen and so God's just not going to stand for it amen we're talking about those things what about the life building that God is calling us to God's calling us to build lives. We got children in the house. They're called to build lives. And if we're not cultivating in them that idea that, okay, you are building lives for something even greater than yourself, um, um, building lives for a greater purpose, they'll lose sight of it. You know, we, we as adults lose sight of it. And so we want to begin to cultivate what God is building on the inside of us. Amen. And so even as we, you know, can talk about considering our ways, I still, even in this place of God, okay, you're correcting me, you're correcting me, you're correcting me. He is considering our ways and he wants you to be encouraged that he's considering you. This is still a consideration of you. You think you, it feels like, God, well, you're taking this away. You're taking this away. You're taking this away. Well, no, that's still a consideration of you because you don't want those things to be wasted. You don't, you don't want your money to be wasted. You don't want your relationships to come to nothing. So I have to do this. I have to tell you this so that those things that you do want and desire don't go to waste too. Amen? They don't go to waste too. God is mindful of you. And the thing is, his consideration will be comfort combined with correction. Amen. His consideration is the comfort of God combined with correction. I don't know if you've ever been in a hard place. And like, like you said, it was like, yo, this is so hard. I'm going through, I'm, I'm hurt. I'm so hurt. But, and God is compassionate to that place that you're in, but he's not going to leave you just with compassion. He's also going to bring correction because that comes together in the consideration of you. Amen. Amen. And you can't also just only have correction and not have compassion because then you feel like, well, where's the balance in that? I just feel like I'm getting beat over the head, beat over the head. But I want to encourage us today that his consideration is that co that coming together of compassion and correction. Amen. So even as we move into verse 12, you know, we begin to see that balancing back in, amen, of what God is speaking to the people of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Child, I could let you take verse 12. Turn right on. You got it, man of God. Ooh, man, hit me upside the head. Verse 12, come on. Then Zerubbabel, a last scripture, the son of uh, Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and all the people did fear before the Lord. Amen. When we look at these names, I, 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 it's so key. Zerubbabel, Shealtiel, Joshua, and Joseph. And when you begin to break down in the Hebrew what these things mean, Zerubbabel means to sow. Shealtiel means prayer. Joshua means believing. And Jehozadak means God can do. So as you sow and as you work and as you pray, believing God will do it. As you sow, as you reap, as you pray, believing God will do it because it means Jehovah is righteous. Come on. There's an order here. And even as we look at it, what, what God began to deal with me about is that when you're talking about the work, the thing that you have to do, the mountain that you have to climb. You don't stop because sometimes I know it can feel like I'm here on this mountain, but I feel like by myself. I feel like I'm climbing and I'm, I'm having to come out of this place. But you're not by yourself because he is with you and he's telling you and he's encouraging you on the way that you can do it. Come on. Come on. Rear left. Come on. I know there's some gravel here. I know you just slipped, but come on. Grab. Take with your left hand. Pull. 
pull, 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 keep pulling, keep pulling, shift over to the right. Look, watch out for this. Go um, and maneuver over in this side of the terrain. He will instruct you and he will do it, but you cannot stop. You keep working. And this is the interesting thing, even as, like I said, I have been dealing with, even in myself, like, oh, the ministry, the ministry. Like, what's, what, like, what are we doing? And, he, and one thing that he began to tell me, you don't stop, though. Just because there may have been others who have, just because, like, uh, uh, you don't feel like your re- the resources that you had before were once there, that doesn't give you an excuse to stop. And a lot of times we begin to set up excuses for ourselves, like, okay, you know what? This is not in place anymore. I don't have this. I don't have these resources. So I get, you know, I give up. I'm, I, I lift my hands up to this. A matter of fact, I, I put, I'm going to take my hands off the plow concerning this one because I just don't see the point. I don't see how I can keep going. But he never said for you to stop. And that's not an excuse for you to stop. Ah, you keep working, he said, until the right people show up. You keep working until the people show up. For some people you need are already here, but you avoid them. And this is the thing that he began to do with me about. You want and are waiting, like, God, do it, send these. But the people that you need, they're right there with you. Giving you the truth that you need. Giving you the encouragement that you need. Giving you the prayer that you need. The correction that you need. But what we do we avoid it. We avoid those people. And you want, send somebody else. No. In that person that you keep avoiding, that you don't want to say hi to, it's in them. Yeah. They're already there. And you're still trying to climb this. We talked about isolation, right? And even in this mountain, he's instructing them to go. He didn't just say, he didn't just say Zerubbabel. He didn't just say one person. He's calling a group of people to go. And we're still trying to climb certain mountains on our own. Come on. There's some things we're still trying to build on our own. And it's not possible. It's not possible. He gave Eve to Adam. Man shall not, it's not good for man to be alone. <laughs> Somebody felt oh, that. Praises in the house on that one. <laughs> but you still, <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, God. <laughs> but there's some place, if you would have stopped avoiding the relationship that you need to be connected to, maybe that person that you're supposed to be with will come. Maybe this is the foundation that he has to set in you first. Maybe this person that you're trying to avoid is preparing you for your Boaz or for... <laughs> <laughs> But we keep trying to climb. We keep trying to do this thing on our own and avoiding the people that have already been there to set in place that was meant to help you. But keep working at it. And this is the thing about when we're when when you're talking about climbing this mountain, right? What he began to do with me about. He said the people don't know. And we talked about this last week. We need to. We sit together. The people don't know how to climb and pray. We don't know how to climb and pray, how to pray and climb, how to communicate with God as we're in route. Help us to multitask, Lord. Mm-hmm. Mm. We pray hoping God will actually carry us up. Mm, take me up, God. Ah, yeah. And he's like, no, you come up, climb. I'll be there. Or we climb without wisdom and instruction. Okay, this is the mountain. All right, cool. Backpack ready, and you start running, and no instruction. You've never climbed this way before, never 
have journeyed this way before and you think you already know? Mm -mm. And then you think you already know, but you have to bring people with you. Not everybody's at your same caliber, strength, place. And so there is instruction that he must give, even when you look at Scripture, him telling these great leaders, this is what you tell the people. This is what you instruct the people in this way. Moses, could, Moses, David, they couldn't have come up with these things on their own. God gave them these instructions. And we're distracted to pray. As you're climbing, you're so distracted by the terrain, by what you see, you forget to pray. Too distracted to climb because you're so in your head. Sometimes you don't even realize that I have to see this for myself. When the man of God would be like, would, would make me go pray, and I would come out of prayer, and he'd be like, no, go pray again, because you ain't hear him, because you ain't changed. You're still in the same place, because even in that place of prayer, you don't even realize prayer can be something where you'll stay stuck in, where you'll pray. You're not even praying in faith. You're not even praying believe. You'll pray, and you'll keep staying in a place of prayer. Ain't no faith tied to it, and you'll stay right there with no action. We have to climb and pray as you go, okay, God, what do I do? I was talking to somebody when we were in ce at celebration. He was like, you know, sometimes I just, you know, don't, I don't know. I've never been this way, so I don't know how to, uh, we were talking about business. He was like, I don't know how to charge people. I don't know, like, what the labor of work is. Like, I don't know how to research even, uh, you know, my, what other people are charging. I was like, you don't got to do that. Just have you ever asked God? what to charge you don't know I never I never thought to ask him that that here's God blessing you along the way and here's this opportunity are you asking God as he's opening the door okay God you bless me with it now what do I do with it okay here's this thing like well, how much do I charge how much should I charge them doesn't have to be blanket and each time it might be something new he might give you a number that will help them and help you. But we think like, well, I've never been in this place before. I don't know. Pray. So many businesses burst, burst out of our apostle. He never did it before. He would tell us the stories about all the time how to write. You know, he didn't know how to write a, write a 501c3. And he would say, the Lord showed me. He would go into prayer and gave me everything. The business plan, the proposals, the presentations. And I would take those stories, even from my own career. I'm like, okay, God, I'm in the, I'm in the field of, of creative, of creativity. You are the awesome creator. And so I know that you'll give me ideas and witty inventions. And when she was talking about when those witty inventions drop, that's when I know I'm like, okay, I'm off. Cause God, I ain't got no ideas. And I can't even hear, well, God, let me come to you. What's the idea for this one, for this brand, for this thing, for this thing? Show me the way. So many business, Mother Val. Child, she got an idea every five minutes, child. Y'all, 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 let me tell you what God showed me. And it'd be so good. The acronyms be so on point. I'm like, yeah, that's God, because that's so dope. He will give it to us. But we have to climb and pray. Don't think that just because your calf muscles done got built up halfway that you can handle the rest of the journey on your own. And it shows as you continue to work and you're waiting on people to come or those who are connected to you, even if they're not motivated right at first. But if you go, it shows two things. Okay. Somebody gone before me that I can see, that I can do it. Paving and clearing the path for me. And not even that they're doing it. They're praying. God is showing them how to do it. And then it shows God, God, I'm willing. First, I'm willing to go when see my faith and see my work and see my heart that I trust you. And when he hears your prayer, that as you climb and as you pray and as you're inquiring of him, as you're asking him how to come back to the altar, how do I come back to this place? As you do it, believing, he meets you. It talks about a remnant. 
the people obey the voice of the Lord, and the words are tied by the pack, and the Lord sent Joshua down to you, and the Lord did feel before the Lord. It, it was talking about a remnant of this people who obeyed. Not everybody is going to come, y'all. And we let our focus be shifted from the altar. We let our focus be altered because we don't see who we want to see with us. When my family was not on board with my salvation. I could have done two things. I could have said, you know, maybe this isn't right. I could have listened to them. All these people contradicting what I know. I know God spoke to me. I know he met me. I'm not crazy. Like, the situation was crazy if I tell you how it happened. But I know what. And the man of God confirmed it. I know what I'm doing is right. And as I'm obeying, I'm, I'm seeing the fruit of my labor. But when they were speaking against it and didn't understand, because a carnal mind can't understand spiritual things, I didn't let that speak against me or come against my faith. I stood up for what I believe in. Hey, listen, I let this go on for long enough. If you are going to continue to speak up against what I believe, my leader, and what I'm doing, and if you don't want to support, that's cool. You don't have to call anymore because I'm not going to pick up the phone to hear anything that was going to contradict my faith. I'm just in a different place. I love you. But I love him more. Jesus. Yeah. 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 Hang up. And they came, a few weeks later, they came right back. I won't do that no more. You know, and that hurt. And that was just like, I don't even know if I'm going to ever hear from my family again. In that sense. But God, what I do know is that your thoughts towards me are peace and not of evil. And so I trust you. I don't know how, but I'm just going to continue to trust you. We have to be willing. And we got, and even as we're looking at this, this mountain to climb, the people that we must go with, this rebuilding of the altar, getting back in order what has already been established. Come on. They obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet and the Lord their God had sent him and the people did fear the Lord. And this is what I love. We talked a little earlier about the joy. When you look at the, the root word of Haggai, what it means, it means festive. And what the Lord began to speak to me about is that there can be joy in the work. Thank you, Lord. There can be joy in obedience. There can be joy in faith. Hallelujah. And we look at these things and it's just like, oh, I'm going to do this thing and I'm not going to have joy in it. No, it'll be the place where joy is abundant. Yes. He sent this prophet, this specific one to show there's joy in this thing and he'll restore joy Hallelujah. as you come and yield. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to just read verse 13. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, and the Lord's message to the people unto, unto, unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. In the presence of the Lord is constant refreshment. The joy of the Lord is our strength. That strength that we need to climb this mountain, to do, to obey, to yield. Joy is there. We don't got to think like this is about to be like, you're about, about to be working and slaving and, and, and nothing's going to. But that's, it speaks to your faith. Do you not believe that your labor is not in vain? Amen. Come on. We have to get back to this place where, our la where we know, understand, we believe our labor is not in vain. Amen. He is with us, y'all. Yes. And in this place where we are refocusing, where, our, where our, our altered focus is now coming back to a place where it's on him, where we're considering our ways, where we're examining these things, watch joy begin to meet you. Come on. As you come back to this altar, watch joy begin to meet you because the answer, the solution of 
the issues that you've been having, the course correction, the realization like, I've been looking at this the wrong way. God, I've been looking at you the wrong way. He is with us. Come on, the Lord is with me. The Lord is with me. Come on, come on, come on. And there is joy in this place of obedience. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. 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 Well, we hope that you got something from the word today. Amen. Um, you know, this it's an ongoing thing, right? We're always considering our ways. Hallelujah. But we want to let you know, we want to encourage you that God is with you as you're doing all that considering. Amen. You're not going to be overwhelmed. He's going to give you exactly what you need, what you need to focus on from day to day. Amen. Hallelujah.